Our next presenter is Melanie Lepa, owner and agrologist with Soils and Such Agronomy, and she'll be discussing Growing Chickpeas 101. Melanie produces, provides services such as soil sampling, crop planning, record keeping, fertility recommendations, and crop scouting. Welcome, Melanie. Thanks, Trent. Everybody can hear me and take it, so I don't have to yell. That's great. Um, I'd just like to thank you for inviting me. It's kind of exciting to go to an in-person meeting and actually get to see faces to talk to. It's, it's uh, kind of exhilarating, actually, to get back to some form of normal. So um, they asked me to speak about Chickpeas 101. And uh, basically what I decided to do is kind of do an overview of uh, what you need to think about if you want to grow chickpeas. Does anybody grow chickpeas in the room? Yay, there is a person. So you're not going to learn anything new, probably, but hopefully everyone else will. So the question is, are chickpeas for you? And I think the first question you need to ask yourself is if whether or not you love your sprayer as, as much as you should to grow chickpeas. Um, because if we get some moisture, you're going to spend a lot of time in it. So you better have a love for it. And uh, I hope you have a lot of access to water um, because we're spraying a really big bushy crop when we do get moisture. So we need good coverage. So you need lots of water. It's always kind of a bone of contention with the few chickpea growers that I have on how much water can I get away with? And they, they all have more water tanks since they hired me because you need lots of water. Um, you also need to be willing to sign up for a babysitting service because you need to scout them every week every five days, to be honest with you. And uh, so whether you want to do that yourself or find someone like myself or a local agronomist, like a, a retail agronomist or someone, but you need someone on your team probably to help you uh, see through the fog out there and, and help you make decisions on, on what needs to be done in a chickpea field because it can get overwhelming. And you also need the patience of a saint because it's like, don't spray, do spray. Is it going to rain? Are they going to ripen? When can I harvest them? So I do think if you can answer yes to all those questions, then chickpeas might just be for you and your farm. So I've put together some things to think about when growing chickpeas. And first and foremost, you need to decide what kind you want to grow. Do you want to grow the large seeded kabuli type or the small seeded desi type? And in my area, it's all large seeded kabulis. There's hardly any desis that I hear about. There might be the odd guy around, but uh, my clients all grow the large seeded kabuli type. You need to think about where you wanna grow them on your farm, because not all um, fields will be suitable for them. So you need to think about your soil type. So stray away from the heavy clay soil. That's probably not where chickpeas are gonna be happy, especially if it's a wetter year. Um, so for us, you know, we do have some heavy ground um, in the south and, and there's some successful chickpea growers in that ground too. Um, but for the most part, we kind of go for the, the lighter textured soils. You also need to think about your landscape. You want to try to avoid the really hilly rolling landscapes because they are an indeterminate crop. So in those low spots, they just may not ripen for you. So, you know, if, if you have rolling land that's significantly rolling, might not be the best place, maybe choose a, a flatter piece of ground. The other thing we think about down in our neck of the woods is, is the cropping history in and around our fields. Um, you don't want to bump up against last year's chickpea stubble if you can avoid it or your neighbor's last year's chickpea stubble as well. Um, disease travels pretty easily through chickpea fields. So if you can try to avoid that, that that'll help you a little bit in, in the management of chickpeas. They don't love saline soils at all, and they do not do well in waterlogged soils at all. So hence the stay away from the really rolling landscape as well. And uh, the one big bonus for chickpeas in which I think will maybe make people think about chickpeas a little bit more going forward, is there an alternate crop choice for Aphanomyces? So I do think a lot of people said they're never gonna grow them again and never is a long time. So I, I do expect they might come back into rotation for a few people just on some acres that they can't grow lentils on anymore. So the big thing to know when going into chickpeas is their days to maturity. They're indeterminate, they're very long season. I've seen them ripen 
earlier than 110 days, but most times they're they're pushing that 120 to 130 days, depending depending on what type of moisture we get through the growing season. And some years they just don't ever want to die. In 2016, they just stayed green forever on us, but they also yielded like 45 bushels an acre. So there was some benefits to them staying green for a long time. So some things to think of to think about or be aware of with chickpeas is their drought tolerance, because I think a lot of people initially thought about chickpeas as like a super drought tolerant crop because they're grown in Australia. And yes, they are drought tolerant, but they're also a big plant with a big root system. So they do need some moisture. So they're not quite as drought tolerant as maybe everybody initially thought them to be. They are tap rooted. So if there's moisture down below, they can get to that. Um, unfortunately, where I live, there is no moisture down below. So I'm not sure what they're gonna do this year, but um, uh, they, they, do have, they do carry some drought tolerance. They can be affected by heat stress and they do tend to abort flowers and pods just like any other pulse crop would when they're under heat stress. But the one thing I do wanna mention is you'll always see empty pods in your chickpea field, even if you don't have heat stress or drought stress, it just always seems to be some empty pods out there. So don't get you know, too excited if you do see some empty pods. I'm always snapping pods in chickpea fields and I always find empty ones. And uh, I don't know why they're empty. I'd like to know why they're empty, but they're, they just, it does happen. And it happens more so when it's hot and dry. One thing we think about down in the south is our follow crop expectations for the crop we're going to plant after our chickpeas. Um, after a lot of years of growing chickpeas with some of my growers, we've come to realize that our derm crop isn't quite as good as we'd like it to be following the chickpea. Um, most times likely because of moisture, that taproot has sucked out a bunch of moisture on us. Um, also find that they don't cycle nitrogen as fast in our neck of the woods. So um, we kind of set our expectation levels a little bit lower for the follow crop after chickpeas. As for yield expectations, well, I don't know. That's anybody's guess. Like I said, I've seen them go below 10 bushels an acre and I've seen them go over 40. So um, in our area, probably a 25 bushel average. I suspect that would be possible up here too for an average. Uh, but I don't really know. Do you have an average chickpea yield on your farm that you would, could pull out of the top of your head? Yeah, somewhere in there. That's kind of what I expected. I expect you guys get a little bit more moisture than us and maybe have a little bit better soil. So um, you should probably be able to consistently grow 25 to 30 bushels. When uh, planning for chick chickpeas, I think you need to think about the economics and uh, sharpen your pencil for a budget. Um, it's a bit overwhelming to sit down and figure that all out, but seed costs are expensive, especially if you're buying seed for the first time. Um, they're big seeds, so you need really high seeding rates. So seed cost is something to think about and uh, fungicide budgets need to be high. Um, we've been lucky and got away with two to three apps in the drier years, but we've sprayed up to five times in the wetter years. So um, that's a big part of the budget. There's also a lot of time spent in your chickpeas. So um, if you're going to be a chickpea grower, you have to be willing to you know, put that time in or, or pay someone else to put that time in. Um, that, that is kind of a cost of production, to be honest with you. They, they do require babysitting. There's no going to the lake in July if it's raining and you're a chickpea grower, or at least not going to the lake for very long. So I created kind of a chickpea checklist to think about when you're, plant, or when you're planning to plant chickpeas. And of course, first and foremost is seed and seed quality is extremely important. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have good quality seed with chickpeas. They're big, slow seeds. So we need good germ, we need good vigor. And, and uh, in, in my books, you need 0% ascochyta. You really do need 0% ascochyta to get a good start. You don't wanna put ascochyta in your field it's likely already there or somewhere close to your field anyhow, so try to go in with zero if you can. When it comes time to seed them, they do require a warm, moist seed bed. And if you do some literature searches, you'll find you know, seven degree soil temperatures and 10 degree soil temperatures, um, seven for desis, 10 for kabulis. I'll be honest, my growers don't wait for 10, Never, not a chance. They, if they waited for 10, then they'd be worried at the back end that they might not get them in, but they do wait at least till five degrees, pushing towards seven, and they wait till their soils are on that warming trend up. So um, I, I have one grower that has planted them really early and he is just the luckiest guy I know. He seems to get away with it, but I always try to encourage him to kind of pull back the reins and wait for that soil to warm up so we can get that good seed soil contact and get them to germinate quickly and pop out of the ground. 
When it comes to seating rates, um, I always use the 1,000 kernel weight and do the calculation. Um, it's important to wait and do your 1,000 kernel weight after your seed is cleaned because chickpeas produce a myriad of different sizes, you know, below six or below seven millimeter, up to 10 millimeters seed size. So it's good to do that after your seed is cleaned so you actually know what you have for a seed lot. And uh, for kabulis, I target about three and a half plants. And with desis, in the past, I've targeted around four plants per square foot. You can just see in that picture, like they, they take a long time to fill out the field. It looks like nothing is growing out there forever. And then all of a sudden one day, there's a whole bunch of branches on those chickpeas. When it comes to choosing inoculant, because they are a pulse crop, they need inoculant. And it's, it's extremely important to get the right inoculant for chickpeas. It is uh, not your typical run of the mill lentil and pea inoculant. It is a specific strain of rhizobia for chickpeas. And in our country, granular just makes the most sense for everyone. Pretty much all my growers use granular inoculant. And, and going to check for nodulation is a pretty pretty cool experience with chickpeas. If you, if you all grow lentils, you know, the nodules are there and they're sometimes they're pretty tiny and stuff. But on chickpeas, there are these giant pink brains in your field. It's pretty cool to actually go out and find them. And they're almost always that big. Even in the dry years, they're, they're quite large. So it's, it's kind of a cool thing to see if you've never seen it before. When it comes to uh, seed treatment, like I mentioned, chickpeas are big seed and they're slow. So it's really important that you have uh, a good quality seed treatment and good coverage because the kabulis are that lighter colored seed. They have low tannins, so they're very sensitive to soil-borne funguses, especially pythium. If you do not treat your kabulis, they will not grow very well at all. Back in the early years, if you guys tried to, when we didn't really know, plant and it, it didn't turn out so well. So it's really important to do a really good job of treating the seed. When it comes to fertility, I always, well, usually recommend choose fields with lower end status. That might be a challenge this year for some growers, but for the most part, we, we tend to go in. Most of my growers use inoculant, so we tend to pick the lower end fields. They're usually going on Durham stubble and there's not much left for us anyhow. So that works out great for most of our growers. Um, most growers start with a, a phosphate blend of some sort, kind of aiming around that 20 pounds of P205 um, which is safe with most of the drills that my guys run in the seed row. They are sensitive to seed placed fertilizer, so it's important to be aware of what that number is for your soil and your, your opener on your drill. They are fairly big users of phosphate though, so it's important to put that there. And I always think of phosphate as that pop-up starter fertilizer and it's a long, slow crop. So it's, it's smart to put some there and have it, have it present to get that crop up and out of the ground. There is a segment of growers that choose to not inoculate and use nitrogen fertilizer instead to grow chickpeas. And I think there's actually a growing number of growers that are doing that. Maybe not this year with urea prices being as ridiculous as they are. Maybe that'll change some of their, their choices, but um, there's a big segment of growers, not so much in my area because my chickpeas are really in the deep south. So we tend to get the weather that brings them in. But as people branch out of those areas, a lot of them look to using um, nitrogen fertilizer. And basically the theory is they put down enough fertilizer to get that crop up growing, produce seed, and then it runs out of fertilizer and that gives it that stress to ripen. So it's kind of a way to ensure that they get their crop to come in. So, and, and they're quite successful with it. I know a few agronomists from you know, east and south of us that are, are really successful chickpea growers putting you know, 50 to 60 pounds of actual N on and uh, getting that crop to come in. It's just not a practice that my growers use, um, but it is, it is an accepted practice by quite a few in other parts of the province. One of the challenges with growing chickpeas has always been weed control, although I do think it's actually getting better for us. Um, you know, back in the day when we first started growing chickpeas, we had edge and trifluralin, and that was pretty much it. And now with the advent of all these pre-emergent products, I have chickpeas on all those products listed. So I've seen chickpeas on Authority, works fabulous, chickpeas grown on Volterra, um, chickpeas growing on fierce ground, they, they all, if they, if they get rain to activate, they work really well. And they kind of give you a little bit of relief in the chickpeas that maybe you'll actually keep your field fairly clean. Because once they do get up and bush out, they are somewhat competitive, it just takes them a long time to get there. The other, the other thing with chickpea weed control is in-crop choices are very, very limited. Basically, you have Metribuzin, which is Sencor, which I'm not a huge 
fan of. I guess I'll be getting my head wrapped around it a little bit more going forward, but it's it's harsh on crops. It's hard on lentils. It's hard on chickpeas. So I try to avoid that as much as possible with my growers. There is a new one coming out this year called Tough. Um, it's a group six contact as well. And it looks like in combination with Metribuzin, it's actually pretty good on, uh, on kosha, which is one of our biggest challenges in our chickpea field. So I hope I get to see some tough this year. I, I missed the boat on getting a trial in my area. And uh, so I, I'm kind of sad that I missed that, but I hope I get to see a little bit of it this year. And then of course, for group one grassy weeds, all the pretty much all the grassy group one products that you use in lentils work in, in chickpeas too. So, and I'll just mention that all the new chickpea varieties that are coming out are all clear field. So that, that may or may not, you know, give you another option um, for, for me in my rotations, chickpeas are always a reason to not use a group two. So I don't feel that the clear field will be helpful to my growers, but it might be helpful on lots of other farms and stuff too. So it is, it is a benefit though, to at least have some herbicides that we can safely spray on chickpeas in season. On to the scary part of chickpeas, the nightmares. I have actually woke up in the middle of the night looking at chickpea lesions and arasca cut lesions on chickpeas because I've spent hours and hours looking at them during the day and they are it is a bit of a nightmare to manage ascochyta but it can be managed it just I think what growers need to really wrap their head around is that belief that you'll have a perfectly clean crop needs to get out of your head right away because you won't it just doesn't happen um you know, you can have a fairly clean crop but you'll if you look hard enough you will always find some ascochyta even last year in as dry as it was, I could find ascochyta in my chickpea fields. So the key is to scout as early, start start basically once those chickpeas emerge and kind of open up their, their leaflets. Um, and by scouting early, you can maybe catch that photo with the little kind of dark brown pinprick dots. You may catch that in your field. And to me, what that is, is that is ascochyta spores that have spread and they've infected that leaflet but they've been stopped by the natural resistance spread into that plant. So that's your indicator right there that you have ascochyta present in your field and you need to be on your game to get your fungicide out there if you don't have it out there already fairly soon after you notice that. Because that resistance mechanism doesn't last for very long in those plants and then the ascochyta can overcome it, especially if you get the right conditions. So. Um, we aim our first fungicide application somewhere around the 8 to 10 node stage. Some years that's 10 to 12 nodes, like last year. It was definitely a, a bit later because it was dry. So um, we, we planned our, our fungicide application based on weather forecast more than anything. It's like, okay, it looks like we're going to get a couple days of showers. Let's get our, our first app out there. So once you do have some spread, um, you'll get these lesions that appear in four to six days and they're very characteristic and easy to identify. They've got that bl dark brown ring around them and uh, you'll get some black pycnidia that form in the center. And that's, that's what starts the cycle all over again. And it just goes and goes, it just cycles over and over and over throughout the year. Every time you have moisture that can allow it to spread. So it is, it's a bit of a full-time job managing chickpeas or well, it's just a calendar job for some too. They just, they just plan in their calendar when they're going to do it and just, you know, kind of massage the timeline a little bit based on weather conditions. But it can get as bad as stem lesions and it, it even did last year. Every year I, we do lose some yield to stem lesions. It's actually kind of crazy to watch a chickpea with a stem lesion. If it's well supported by other chickpeas in the field, it'll still pump nutrients and water through that stem lesion and fill those pods. I'm sure not to the same extent as it could but uh, you will see the branches that bend over and break off and die and that's complete yield loss so um, Michelle Hubbard who just spoke she did a survey and found that strobe resistance is very common in us in the Ascochyta isolates that she's identified in the province so um, it's, it's super key to watch your rotation of products and I'll always, always try to mix the different groups. And it's really hard to do, but you, you need to do it. And I actually have a chart in my next slide to, to show you what limited options there are. But we live and die by the weather forecast and by our scouting. We just try to sandwich our um, fungicide apps in before rain or heavy dews. If, you know, if it's heavy dew all the time, then our timeline tightens up. 
for our chickpea fungicide applications. And there is a decision support guide that SAS Pulse has made. Um, I don't use it anymore myself because I've kind of got it figured out in our neck of the woods, but it, it might be actually really beneficial for growers that are new into chickpeas and especially outside of the traditional chickpea growing area to help you kind of get your head around, you know, when, when you're at risk and when you should think about spraying. So this is a list of the fungicides that are registered for Ascaceta control in chickpeas. And uh, there's a pretty common theme of group 11 in there. So um, a lot of group 11s, 11s, 7s, and 3s. And then, of course, the old Bravo Echo M5. And uh, so it is challenging to pick a good um, rotation of fungicides for chickpeas and to do it well. Um, it, I know I struggle with it every year. About this time of year, I sit down and think, OK, what, what am I going to tell my growers this year for what products we should be using? So. Um, the big thing is never ever apply that group 11 by itself, never, ever, ever. And uh, I try to apply my group 11 only once per season. You can do it up to twice, but I, I try to get it early, either first or second app um, in chickpeas just to, because there are still some isolates out there that are sensitive to the group 11. So it's not like you're gonna breed a whole bunch more resistance if you put 11 mixed with a seven or 11 with a three in your early application of a group 11. It, it still is doing something for you. Also, it provides that stroby kind of boost, that greening effect. So that's not a bad thing at the start of the chickpea season. It's definitely not something you want at the end. And we learned that the hard way over the years when we didn't have a lot of choices out there. We were flogging strobies on there and then wondering why our chickpeas wouldn't die in August because we kept pushing you know, a greening fungicide through them. So it is, it is a challenge, but it can be managed. The other two diseases that sometimes affect chickpeas, but not very often in, in our neck of the woods is sclerotinia and botrytis. And uh, the only times I've seen sclerotinia in chickpeas is in the really wet years. And it's kind of patchy and uh, really heavy canopies in there, right, When in those wet years. So um, I think more than anything, we're struggling to maybe get our fungicide timing right and get it into the canopy. and. Uh, it, it becomes just one of those things that helps kind of bring the crop in, to be honest with you. But if you're, you know, I think we've kept it at bay somewhat. If, of course, I don't have any fields that never got sprayed, so I don't ever have a comparison. But it is a, it's a challenging disease to manage. And I have never personally seen botrytis at any significant level, but it's possible. It is possible. So insects are not really a major challenge in chickpeas, as far as I'm concerned. Um, every year I find wireworms in chickpea roots. It's kind of cool, actually. Like, they burrow right into that root. But they have such a big, thick root and stem that I don't find that they do a whole lot of damage to the chickpea, but they're still there, and uh, they're still injuring that tissue. Um, and I also see this kind of feeding in the other picture there with my, my nicely wrapped thumb that I hurt a couple springs ago, um, that type of feeding right at the soil surface. And, and I wonder, well, I think it's it's cutworm just because I know this farm has a lot of cutworm or I've had a lot of cutworm in the past. And I wonder if it isn't some, some cutworm feeding as well that goes on, but same thing, big thick stem, they don't really do tons of damage. I have seen where they've mowed a chickpea right off below the soil surface. And there's three new chickpeas coming out of one seed before, um, but uh, not it's not a major, insects aren't a major, issue in chickpeas. Grasshoppers are super rare, but I do expect they'll probably eat chickpeas if there's nothing else to eat. They'll eat paint, so I can't see why they wouldn't eat chickpeas. Chickpeas kind of give off an acid when you walk through them. If, if, you've, ever, if you've never been in a chickpea field, when you, when you walk through it, if you drag your hands through it, your hands will get kind of wet. And if you taste it, it's, it's acidic. It bites your tongue a bit. And that's what kind of deters a lot of the insects. So that's kind of why grasshoppers don't like, like them. I, was, I also thought gophers didn't like them either, but I actually met a grower last year that lost a half section of chickpeas to gophers. So they will eat them too, sort of thing. So, but insects are the least of our concerns. It's kind of the one crop I'm like, whew, I don't have to worry about those bugs in there for once. Harvest. The biggest challenge is they just don't always want to mature. Some years they do, but basically I would say to a grower, if you get some late season rain, July, late July, early August, you need to kind of wrap your head around what you might want to do for harvest management 
purposes. In, in our neck of the woods, we tend to let them come in, although this is actually a picture from last year, and you would think in that drought that they would have died. But we got some rain in August, and sure enough, just before we were ready to roll with the, chick with the combines, they popped out uh, three new branches, and look at that, some pods even. And it's like, oh, come on, just die. But so we actually had to do some harvest management on these. Most times we don't, but um, if you're in a little bit heavier ground, a little darker soils, I think it's pretty much you're going to plan to do it. And, and I think a lot of growers do do plan to do it. It's just we kind of leave that as one of our our last decisions we make. So, and options are kind of the similar as they are in any other pulse crop, whether you do a pre-harvest glyphosate, reglone, or glyphosate and heat. The key is staging. You just can't expect miracles out of these products. So for me with reglone or glyphosate and heat, it's a super late application. Like I'm basically just knocking the tops off those plants. All the seeds are ripe, completely ripe before we do it because we don't want to risk that MRL side of things and stuff either. So um, we do it really late. Even my glyphosate, if I, I've had to do pre-harvest glyphosate a few times with guys and we, we stage that on the very late end of the spectrum just to just to make sure we're doing it right and doing it safe and they take a long time to come in and they hold their pods well so there's I don't feel like you need to rush them into the bin necessarily unless of course it's getting really late and it looks like it's going to snow of course but um you know if, if they're coming in just try to let them come in on their own if you can so just as a recap some of the top tips tips for successful chickpeas is good quality seed, good germ, good vigor, a really good thousand kernel weight done on them so uh, you know what you're planting. Choose your fields wisely, avoid wet ground, salty ground, really hilly ground. Um, prepare to do your weed control in advance. Um, those pre-emergent products, they're, they're awesome to have in our tool belt now. Um, Timely disease management, make a plan, get your products lined up well in advance. I know it sucks to pre-plan everything because I feel like that's what all we do now is pre-plan absolutely everything, but that's what a good chickpea grower does is they they pre-plan their fungicides. They actually get them on farm and have them and because if we need them, we need them right now sort of thing. And then only use pre-harvest operations if conditions warrant. And with all of that, hopefully anybody who decides to delve into the world of chickpeas can can uh, have some success at it. I know my growers, they're still growing them and some of them are 20 plus years of growing chickpeas. So um, they, they make it, they're making them pay and it's, it's working out for them quite well, but they, they are daunting. The, the whole disease management side of it is a daunting task, but you know, it, it can be done. So with that, I wish everybody um, some rain this year and uh, a successful growing season. And I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any. Or maybe I've scared you all and you're never going to grow chickpeas. Oh, no, not her. <laughs> Thanks, Mel. Um, you're, I want to thank you for your presentation and coming today. We really, really support all the work that you do with chickpeas and value your knowledge. Um, so I have a question, and it's related to varieties. Um, just before I kind of ask that question, I'll give you a couple minutes to get think about it. Um, as we talk about varieties, and guys will be, you know, going back and looking at the seed guide, I just wanted to clarify one thing for those that are in our audience, that if you're looking in the seed guide and you're looking for clear field, you won't find it because they're not actually branded clear field. Oh. They're imi tolerant and right. the new varieties coming out will be imi tolerant. Just so that if you are looking in the guide and looking for that tolerance, look for imi. Um, it will be there and, and you'll see which varieties um, are It's, it's on colors. the far right hand side of the column because I was <laughs> checking it out yesterday. I'm like, I got to remember these because they're new varieties. So I don't have their names at the top of mind yet. But yeah, it's in that chart in the varieties guide. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the question is, 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 you know, you talked a lot about chickpea management and, and thank you for that. So I actually have two questions. One is, what is the variety that you're finding or varieties that are most successful in Saskatchewan so far. Um, so kind of a recommendation on the variety side and that leads in, I guess, into our variety discussion later today. And then the second question is, you know, you talk about sort of considerations um, to think about prior to, con to committing to chickpeas. What would be the reasons guys really are looking at chickpeas? So why do they like chickpeas? Okay. So that's just kind of two questions, thanks. All right, so variety wise, I would say the most common varieties down in our neck of the woods are leader, 
um, followed by Orion. Those are the two most common Kabuli types. I couldn't even tell you the Desi variety because I don't have any Desi growers, but, um, and leader, I would say leader is, is definitely over taking Orion acres um, from the growers that I talked to. Um, I was, I, I'm trying to remember, do you, do you remember the name of the new Emmy tolerant one? Lancer, I believe. Lancer is on the list for a couple of my growers to get their hands on. I don't know if they I actually forgot to check with them and see if they were able to get some. They had signed up for some for this spring, but with the type of conditions we had last year, maybe not. They look to be the highest yielding one. And so that's kind of our next logical step is, is to move move to them. So um, variety wise, those are the ones that, that we use down in our neck of the woods. Um, and um, why do they keep going back to chickpeas or why do they keep growing them? Mm, I think they like the challenge. I think they like the money. <laughs> yes, they like the money. Um, they pencil, they do pencil really well. If you sit down and, and do the, my husband was on my case, he's like, you should put up like an ROI on them. And I'm like, uh, I don't like to do that. <laughs> I mean, I do do it with my clients, but they do pencil really well. I think that's why they go back to them. And it is that whole rotational break for phanomyces. So I'm lucky my farms that are growing chickpeas, they actually don't have a phanomyces. So, but they're in a little drier zone. So um, I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but they've been long-term chickpea growers and they keep coming back, likely mostly for the money. The the pain of spraying and all that is worth the worth worth the money in the end, I guess. So, um, and yeah, it's just nice to have options, right? Like it's nice to have, we can, with chickpeas, we've extended our rotation, right? So we've extended that lentil rotation out by moving chickpeas in. So we don't, we aren't doing lentils every four years now. We're actually lentils every six, you know, or more, depending, depending on what you're all planting and stuff too. So yeah, I, I just, I think that's the two main reasons, money, money and then it works well in the rotation because for those guys who don't have a phanomyces they are terrified and they don't want to get it well uh what would be a, your rotation in six years oh okay so let's say if we do um just thinking about my growers we have durham Lentil, durum. I wish I had a pencil and pen. <laughs> I'm I'm a tactile person. Durum, lentil, say durum or barley. Um, then we would grow chickpeas and then a cereal and then canola and then a cereal and then back to a lentil. That type of rotation and and so it might not be canola. It could be mustard too and then some growers have still have some chem follow in there too so that extends it even further out if they do most of my growers have pretty much got out of chem follow except for maybe a few going back in this year with drought conditions but that's kind of how we've we've just kind of taken that lentil out the one time and put the chickpea in and push the lentil out you know either another three three years past that or two years past that depending depending on the farm 